Hello and good evening out there. I hope you all are doing well. My name is Bethany Dickens Asaf. I have the privilege and honor of being the Mad Lab Literary Manager. So I work a lot with Mad Lab Theater of Columbus as well as OG Productions. Um, thanks so much to those two organizations for sponsoring and for bringing together this event. Um, this is um, I Want to Get Better Playwriting, the first of a series of workshops, introductory workshops um, for theater artists. And I'm really glad you're joining us for it this evening. Um, we have some incredible playwrights who are going to talk about how to get your play from script to stage, whether that's the submissions process, self-producing, working with theaters, um, all that good stuff. If you have a question at any point for any of these playwrights, uh, feel absolutely free to go ahead and leave um, a comment in the underneath the Facebook uh, underneath the Facebook video that you're seeing. Um, I'll see it. I'll throw it up here for the playwrights to answer. So thanks in advance for sending us all of your amazing questions. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring on this distinguished panel. I'm going to bring them all on at once and then introduce them to you all. So. First of all, we have Ellen K. Graham I'm going to introduce first. Her work has been produced widely at theaters across the country. Um, she's also the, the founder of um, Feral Assembly and the co-founder of multiple theaters and theater initiatives. So Ellen, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. I am very happy to be here, thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Mark Harvey Levine. He has had over 1,800 productions of his plays um, around the world and produced in 10 languages, as I understand from his bio, which blows my mind and is so wonderful, um, including two, 12, not two, 12 that he's had produced at Theatre Roulette, I believe. He's a multiple award winner, um, extremely prolific, and a great guy. So, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Total pleasure. Um, next up, we have Isaiah Reeves. Um, his plays have been staged and read by the Classical Theater of Harlem at Lincoln Center, Vintage Soul Productions of Connecticut, the Ensemble Theater of Cincinnati, among many, many others. Um, he is an Iowa Arts Fellow and is pursuing an MFA at the Historic University of Iowa Playwrights Workshop. Isaiah, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Awesome. Next we have um, Scott C. Sickles. Um, his plays have been chosen for production around the world. Um, he's particularly a well-known and renowned um, science fiction writer. His play Outpost was produced by Mad Lab and very soon Playwrights Roundtable, um, the show I'm the artistic director of and we absolutely adore that script. Um, he's won multiple awards including from the Writers Guild of America. So Scott, thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here, thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. And finally, we have Katie Thayer. Uh, she's an outstanding actor, improviser, and playwright living and working in Central Florida. And her work as a playwright and producer can be frequently seen at Playwrights Roundtable um, in Central Florida and also Orlando Fringe, where she's super well known and just yeah, outstanding presence in our theater community. So, Katie, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. All righty. So, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in with some of my questions on. Uh, on the basics of playwriting submissions and scripts to stage and all that good stuff. Mark, I'd like to start with you. Um, so with all of your many, many plays produced, um, I, as a playwright myself, one of the first questions I often get when playwrights, they've written something, they really believe in it, they want to start moving more into the submissions process, um, but they've, they don't know where to start. Where would you tell them to start and maybe what are some tools that you would recommend for them to look into as they begin that journey? Um, well, the, the lovely thing is, is when you're starting now, there are so many um, places you can go to get submission opportunities, and submissions are easier now, too. Like, when I started, you had to print your play out and put it in an envelope and take it to a place called the post office and mail it. Um, yes, where now you just have to start an email and make an attachment. But where? Where do you send those plays? So there's all kinds of, of places. Um, there's the uh, NYC... P Blogspot, I think it's called, um, the London Playwrights Blog, uh, there's a thing called stageplays.com. They all have newsletters, weekly newsletters that they send out, they email to you, and they're just chock full of submission opportunities. Mm. Uh, another great place is um, the New Play Exchange, NPX, as we call it. Um, and if you put your plays up there, uh, not only can theaters find you, but theaters will also post submission opportunities, and you'll get a little email 
uh, if you so desire, um, that says which of your plays are eligible for any particular opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you can just go and literally tag your play um, in some cases, and you've submitted to it, or, you're, or just it'll give you the email address and you can submit that way. But there's like a million places where you can find submission opportunities these days. Um, if you if you do it right, uh, you can have more submission opportunities than you have actual time to submit. <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Been there. And on the subject of the new play exchange, I mean, I think for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what it is or hasn't really tried it out, um, like, please do. Has anyone had an experience with a theater maybe reaching out because they found your play on NPX and they want to produce it? Is there anyone here who can and maybe speak to that part of it and how to how how you approach working with that theater then at that point? Um, it did happen to me. I'm sure it's happened to probably Scott. <laughs> it happened to 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 me um, um, once. And so, and they, you get rights requests, and um, yeah. and um, I'm fortunate enough to be represented. So I went to um, the rights request, went to my agent, and it was um, it was actually just for a reading. And, and unfortunately, there's not really a story here. They kind of um, paid the rights for the reading and and did it. And um, it was not really a, a new play development situation. They just kind of wanted to hear the play, and that was you know that's kind of thrilling in and of itself. That it's getting a new audience but uh so yeah i'm sorry there there wasn't there wasn't really a story <laughs> <laughs> well i mean sounds like it was it, like the process can be very nice and easy and streamlined at that point so i think that's a good thing and it's rewarding so mm -hmm. another good thing about the new play exchange for all new playwrights out there it's a great place to read work from other writers including these writers here before us <laughs> Please look into that. That is a great tool. Does anyone else have a tool that they'd like to share or a place for playwrights to start this, their submissions journey? Um, I use um, Play Submissions Helper, which is, um, and that um, basically you get uh, a spreadsheet every month, an Excel spreadsheet that you download. I actually co opted into the thing that keeps track of my scripts. And it, it, it costs like seven dollars a month, six seven dollars a month. Uh, it's totally worth it. But uh, um, yeah, that's that's what I use. And it really, you can just—it's like someone has done all of that research for you, and then you can just go down and just eliminate the the opportunities that don't pertain to you, and then um, um, apply to the ones that do. Just um, read them carefully. Yes. That's always a good, good piece of advice. Actually, Isaiah, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna throw the next question to you along the lines of, I know you've worked with a lot of different kinds of theaters. When you are starting to approach a theater maybe that you haven't worked with before for the first time, whether they, it's been a, you've submitted something to them or they've reached out to you directly, what are some things that you look for when working for a theater for the first time? What are maybe some red flags versus what are some things that, that you, can, you can tell it's gonna be a, a successful collaboration? First of all, have someone who trusts in the legal space and the artist representation in case if you're not represented. I think I'm, actually gonna, I'm actually gonna stop you for a second because I think we've got some um, some sort of interference or feedback on your video. Um, <laughs> would you mind maybe <laughs> Maybe muting and trying without the headphones, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure it's happening or if it's a connection issue. So I'm gonna ask you that same question because I know you've got an amazing response, but I'll go ahead and throw that question over to Ellen. Um, if you could speak to that first, then we'll bring in Isaiah. So I think so much of my experience in the theater has been about building relationships. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado, which is actually geographically really isolated, like right in the middle between Chicago and LA. It's kind of the only um, pretty big theater market. So I've been very dependent on cultivating relationships um, with theaters. So I think when doing kind of cold submissions to theaters elsewhere, um, I think I just look really close. And actually Mad Lab's a great example of that. I just really, really liked the way that the sub submission criteria were written. It was very appealing to me. Um, and I, I guess th that was that was like a big part of it. And I think then at, you learn more about a company and in your interactions with them. And I think as I get to know other companies, and then you, know, you look you look at their website, you look at pl plays they produced, you know, that's I think really important too. But um, 
uh, it's really important to me to have people who are easy to work with, um, mm. with having that kind of um, with that relationship that you can build over time and not have it be a one-off. That's what I'm always going for, like cultivating relationship with the theater. And so I think I really, um, I really look, for, I really look for that. And I think um, when possible, and I know this, this is going to sound funny in the current moment we're in, but um, travel and meet people, even if you get a, like a 10 minute mm. play produced, if you can make your way to Columbus or to Chicago or New York city, go, um, and and meet those people and shake their hands and and then it's no longer a cold submission. That was kind of a long answer to a short question. But. <laughs> no, that's a wonderful answer, and I, and I fully agree with that. And I think there's a reason that you know at Mad Lab, you know, we really want to foster that connection. Um, and so and and you know, we also, I think, just for me as a playwright, it is such a great networking opportunity, right? Like I think a lot of us submit a lot of plays. And sometimes it can feel like, wow, you know, why am I doing this sometimes? But that's the key thing. That's the really, that's the amazing thing you can get out of this as you begin those relationships. Like you said, even if it's just 10 minute, five minute play. Um, Isaiah, if you want to try and meeting again. <laughs> Say something. Can you hear me? It's very strange. It's kind of garbled. Um, how about you try leaving the studio and coming back and we'll try and bring you back. We'll see if that works. You're the best. Thanks so much. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I think um, I think we might be having a little bit of a connection issue, but we'll try and get Isaiah back. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that? Any good experiences working with theaters? Anything you'd like to share from your Best experience, Scott, Mark, or Katie? <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, what Ellen said. It's definitely about building relationships. I mean, you asked her, like for players just starting out, you know, so of course they've got to look at the uh, blind submission opportunities or for theaters that don't know them. But yeah, once I'm in a theater, I like to use, I actually use Facebook a lot. Um, I, you know, try to friend all the actors, the director, anyone who worked at the theater so that I can build that relationship. Which you know I have done in my life, and then when you go and you actually see the show and find out that it's good, then you grab onto those theaters, you know, and hang on to them for dear life. That's great. All right, I think Isaiah's back. Good try and bring Isaiah on again. Hello, Isaiah. Yeah. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? I can sort of hear you. Unfortunately, I think we're having a connection issue. Yeah. Um, it says my network. Technical issues. We can sort of <laughs> How about this? We can sort of hear you. How about you go for it, and um, and I'll come in at the end of, of whatever you're saying to to sort of recap what you're saying for those who can't hear. Go, go for it. Sure. So if you're in a situation where you have contract, um, it's very important to have someone that you trust to look at or use someone in legal space, someone who can translate things that you don't understand, and what's in the contract really, you know, says a lot about a company because there are certain things that are very good and certain things that are not good. So it's important to remember that relationship is very much a big part of age, um, how much respect um, they have for you and your integrity and your artistry. That's really important. Um, also, so again, reiterating some of what's been said, um, people showing up for plays, it's like going to, to see the show or to go to a Zoom or to reach out, to never be afraid to reach out because that's definitely been my experience. And just showing up, making yourself known, the other companies will let you rent space and they will allow you to cultivate those connections and those relationships. Artistic directors are very friendly and you know, we think that they're these scary entities and these scary people Things, right, but it's amazing what an email can do, especially in this time that we're living in this era where we're all digital anyway. Awesome, thanks, Isaiah. So, I'm going to sort of recap what you were saying because I think it was a little time and kind of going in and out. Uh, and Mark had the brilliant idea that maybe in the, for future questions you could type your answer and we'll read it dramatically, which I think is, is awesome. All right. And um, so what you were basically saying, I think, is that, you know, I think it's important to make sure that when you're sort of getting in the legal space and doing a contract with um, 
with an artistic director, with a theater to make sure that, you know, you're represented well, hopefully, but also that you're representing yourself also. I can just speak from my experience that I do think a contract is really important. And if you're a writer, please join the Dramatist Guild and they have sample contracts that you can use to make sure that, you know, your rights are being protected. So making sure you do that. Um, but also, I think you said something along the lines of, you know, go see a show at a theater if you're interested in working with them. That can tell you so much. Reach out to the artistic director, have a conversation. Um, those can be really great things to do, especially in this era where we're all mostly virtual. I know for me personally, I've attended a lot more rehearsals and had a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations with artistic directors than I've ever had before. So. So yeah, thanks for that idea. I hope I recapped that at least kind of. If I didn't, go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll communicate that to our audience. Um, okay, so moving on a little bit from that um, and going back sort of to the, the submissions part of it when you're very first getting started and maybe you're using Playwright Submission Helper or you're finding opportunities in New Play Exchange, you've, you started to find, let's say you find an opportunity and it's great or you find a hundred what are some do's and don'ts? And Scott, I'll throw this one to you first. What are some do's and don'ts that you would um, tell our, our playwriting audience to consider when they're submitting somewhere in terms of their application? Um, just uh, really um, pay attention to the instructions. What I'll frequently do is I'll, I'll, um, I'll put the, um, I'll copy and paste the email instructions into or, or the, um, the the submission instructions into an email and go through it like line by line to make sure that they have you know like that 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 they have a blind copy if they want a blind copy or if they um if they you know what kind of bio they want or because they're all different things and and you also have to be careful if they have like formatting quirks like um you know all of a sudden they they, they want a, a play that um has you know the title and the character descriptions all on the first page um, but not your address. So it's just um, just to be very careful about um, about what they want, and also to make sure that um, that the thing that you're sending them is something that um, you know. They a, a lot of theaters can be very general, but if um, if this is a if this is a theater that's looking for something for their comedy festival, and you have your heart wrenching monologue, maybe not that. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's just um, it, it really is. Um, I mean, research um, um, re research what they what they do and see if you know anything clicks. And um, and again, like just red flags from before. Um, if they have a really awful website, you know, it 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 all depends on how much you want that production. And you know, you might not even get it. It might not even be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so, for that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Follow the instructions. It sounds easy, but given that, you know, for those who haven't done a lot of submitting, you're right. It can be very granular in terms of, and I'll, I'll just let our audience know a blind copy means no writer name, no contact information on there at all. So just making sure that you're abiding by what they are, because these, these theaters, y'all, they get hundreds of submissions. They don't let your play be sort of put aside because <laughs> it was improper, the formatting was not there. Ellen, I see you nodding. Do you wanna chime in on that? Any do's or don'ts that you would tell our, our audience to consider? No, I, I just second everything that Scott said and you you don't wanna give them it. I, I was, what I was saying to myself in my muted room was um, don't give them a reason to disqualify you on a technicality and, and, and I, I've been on um, the other side of submissions, you know, receiving submissions. Um, and if you have a bunch of submissions that can be, it can be kind of a relief for the reader. Like, oh, I don't have to read this script. Like, literally it can be, I don't have to read the script because they didn't follow the, direct, the directions. I mean, but yeah, so don't, don't, um, don't do that as much as you can. And I think being smart about um, being smart about your submissions that made a huge difference for me compared to when I was, you know, 20 years ago starting out when I would submit to everything. And now I'm very targeted about which mm -hmm. theaters I submit to. Um, and so um, even as got as it's gotten more competitive, my acceptance rate has actually gone up because I'm not churning as much. And it was in the old days with the hard copies and the stamps and all that too. It's rough. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I almost never do hard copies anymore. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just, uh, I, I don't have a printer, <laughs> especially this time of COVID. I don't wanna go to Kinko's or anything. <laughs> but there's it is too many opportunities where you can email it. So there's no reason to, but um, I also want to add, like I would say do submit to, when you're, if you're just starting out, do submit to as much as you can, but make sure you fit the criteria. I knew a playwright who was a guy 
and there was a contest that was for women playwrights only, and he was still submitting because he was like, I think my play is really good, and they should, you know, no, it doesn't matter. It's for women <laughs> only. Don't submit to it. Um, because, yeah, I, I've also done, been on the other side, and like Ellen said, it's so easy to go. It's, it's really, sometimes it's a relief to say, oh, okay, we don't have to read this one. Mm. We have 799 others. But and the other thing I would say is don't <laughs> write back a snarky letter when you get your rejection because you're going to get lots of rejections. And I've heard playwrights, you know, write back, you know, how dare you? This is wonderful. You don't even understand my play. Um, <laughs> Scott and I were talking about, there was a, uh, an example recently, a guy who's like, my play is great. You don't even deserve it. And if, if you, if you got a problem with that, you know where to find me. Now they're going to remember that playwright and never, ever do his work again. <laughs> And I think it was a good idea that that playwright shared that with a whole bunch of people who will also never do his work. Right, right, exactly. Really, who wants to be in the room with that guy? Right, and, and Ellen can back me up. Like when you're reading hundreds of plays, if you reject some, you don't remember the playwright. You don't like hate the ones that you you have to say no to. Some of them are like, "This is a great play, but we can't do it for such and such a reason." But you're not going to say, "Oh my God, we're never ever going to read anything by this person again." But if you send a snarky letter like that, then yes, they will never <laughs> ever read anything by you again. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, uh, Mark. And um, Katie, I want to throw something over to you, sort of in that in that same vein of like rejections and all that. I mean, I think if you, if you if you've been doing submissions for a while, or even reaching out to theaters and things sometimes fall through and don't work out. How do you personally deal with those rejections? It's not a very complicated question. <laughs> oh, like you, you deal with them, but uh, that's why I often argue for and usually do self-produce. And there are so many options for self-production now, more than there ever have been, especially now in this digital space where this is an option, right? You don't even need to rent theaters anymore. But uh, I'm a big proponent of the fringe theater circuit, especially if you are a playwright and a performer, you have that kind of creative core, you know uh, which voices you want in your production, you wanna have more creative control over it. I love fringe theater. Uh, I've done a handful of productions. I've done one woman shows. I produced a musical in a bathroom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> A new one, great. one of several, but uh, I'm <laughs> proud of it. But it gives you these options that you wouldn't necessarily have in a traditional theater space. Um, the fringe festivals were started in Edinburgh because they were doing the same work and they wanted to do some fringe theater. So if you're doing something that maybe your submission calls aren't receptive to, or even a weird length show, uh, I like writing 45 to 60 minute shows there is not a great market for that traditionally. There is in fringe theater. Mm -hmm. So if you have a piece that's like that, I have found great success on the fringe and I can name you several actor playwrights who have had a wildly successful fringe theater career. And it's, uh, I obviously am a fan of the Orlando Fringe because that's where I am. It's the oldest fringe festival in the United States. But there are several fringe festivals across the United States. There are many in Canada. There's also a Nordic fringe circuit. There is a European fringe circuit. There is Australian fringes. So if you want to travel once the world gets back to normal or something resembling normal, it is a wonderful opportunity to travel with your art as long as you know how to do those tax deductions. Definitely know how to do your tax deductions. Form an LLC. <laughs> Sorry, that's probably getting two of the weeds, but yeah, thanks for that, Katie. I'm really glad that you pivoted us a little bit to self-producing because you know um, I am also a huge fan of producing one's own work. And I know Isaiah is as well because uh, he's. I know he's done the Cincinnati French Festival as have I. Um, he writes that social media is a very valuable tool to promote self-produced work, especially on Zoom. Um, so promote yourself, use social media as a platform um, for people to get to know you and your work. When you have a Zoom production, have your friends share and include people in your feedback online. I agree. This this is a really great time to do some self-producing. It's a great time to do some marketing um, <laughs> for yourself. Um, has anyone else had any, um, had experience self-producing? And um, I think one of the main questions I get asked by playwrights when they're considering this is, 
how do you meet actors? How do you meet collaborators and people to work with? Um, Mark, I'll, can I throw that to you first? <laughs> sure. Um, I uh, try not to self-produce. <laughs> uh, for one thing, I'm really bad at it. Um, I like I did once self-produce a show of mine in Los Angeles, and I remember sitting in the in the chairs during rehearsal, and in quick succession, somebody came up and said, "So and so just spilled a whole can of black paint backstage," and then right behind him, someone said, "Half the lighting board just froze out," and then behind that, somebody said, "One of the actresses is in the hospital. We're gonna have to replace her." And I was like, I'm never self-producing again. <laughs> but. Um, but I'm assuming you do have people read your work out loud and such. Yes, yes. And so how do you find actors? Well, actually, it goes back to what I said. If you if you keep relationships, if you do get those productions, um, you know, I friend everybody on Facebook. I try to stay in touch with the actors. But let's say even if you haven't had any productions yet, go find a theater and work at it. Every theater mm. needs, you know, once the world's back, every, every theater needs the box office people, the, you know, the people who do administration, um, set builders, they need everybody. They need people who aren't actors actually. And you can join a theater company and be a really valued member. And of course, meet 40 million actors and find out which are the good ones and get them in your play. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I was early in my uh, career, as I was sort of complaining to a friend that um, that like I couldn't meet actors, and she pointed out that I hadn't shown up at any of the local um, like arts events lately. And I think that that really does that really does matter and make a difference. I do want to point out we're about at the halfway point here, so audience, this is your this is your uh, reminder that if you have any questions for these fabulous playwrights, um, feel free to throw them out. And we will answer them um, as soon as we possibly can. I'm going to go back to Isaiah because I know he has a lot to say about self-producing. Isaiah, we'll see if uh, we'll see if it sounds better. Can you hear me now? Ah, it's still the sound is still weird. <laughs> Sorry. Go oh, ahead. Though, go ahead. If you want to try and just sort of give like a brief answer or a brief description of how you self-produce and work with actors, and I'll do what I did before, where I do a little recap and anything else you additionally you want to say, I'll put I'll uh, put it in the chat and I'll communicate it to the to the audience. Self-producing when I was sixteen, and I used my high school friends, and we didn't know anything about lights, and it was very Judy Garland. And Nikki Rooney let's put on the show, and it was great. And, and we ended up selling out by just relying on in our community. So your community can really get back to you and surprise you in a meaningful way. Even people outside of theater can really surprise you. Because before I started, you know, getting these opportunities to have professional production, there wasn't really a way in other than self producing. So many times when we're in this profession, we forget that this is the only option that a number of people have to make their art in the way that they want to make it. So really relying on your community, and that helps build professional connections that will benefit you later and invite local artists, professional artists to your self produced shows is important to help them. I totally agree. So for those, uh, for the audience, um, and Isaiah, again, put it in the chat if, if I misrepresent to you at all. Um, but Isaiah is saying he started self-producing when he was 16. He was originally working with his high school, uh, just high school friends. Um, so sometimes it's not all about working with professional actors. It's just about building that community and finding folks who want to be in that community with you. Um, but that also, as you continue to move through, you know, the self-producing process, or even just, to, you know, I think we all would agree it's better to hear your plays out loud before you submit them. <laughs> just bringing folks together for reading. What's important is that we just, you know, invite people in. Um, you'll be surprised, I think, I always am, at how many actors love to be asked, especially if you, you're thinking of them for a particular role. They want to invite. Katie, are you pointing to yourself? <laughs> So I do want to speak to that as an actor. As someone who is a classically trained actor, it is funny to hear more playwrights say, well, where do we find actors? Actors are always going to be the easiest thing for you to find when you self-produce, and that is the easiest way to say that. Uh, there are a lot of social media tools online. Uh, for example, here in Orlando, I can name eight different Orlando theater networking groups off the top of my head. Easy to post an audition, hey, I need an actor to do this. Uh, if you could put this on tape, if you could do that, 
it is easy. Find them on your Facebook search. Uh, it is easy to find actors. If you have a large theater school in your town, contact the theater professors. I know our theater school had a listserv. So if an audition came through, they would pass it on to us. You will get a lot of responses. So I would say finding actors is going to be the easiest part of self-producing. I totally agree. And once you, and I'll encourage new playwrights out there, once you start to build your sort of collaborators and, and your people, um, it, you, that you'll always have people that you can turn to. And, and Katie and I are in a collective together. So it's really, <laughs> um, we, we, are the, we are each other's examples in that way. Um, Ellen, I know you've started and you've founded and co-founded um, so, many, uh, so many theater groups. And I, I was checking you all out on Facebook. It just looks like such an interesting dynamic and diverse um, groups that you've put together. Um, if someone is interested in sort of just looking around where they are, sort of forming a collective around them of people who want to do do you know your plays or other pl work that you believe in? Would you just have some advice for any of those folks? Sure. I think um, to echo Katie's point, I think that it's easier than you'd think to build up a, a connections with really world class actors. Um, who, if you know, again, if you build these relationships and you you give them awesome roles to play, they will want another role to play. I think the challenge is always space. I think just everybody on this call, we all live in very expensive places. Um, I was very fortunate that my um, partner, uh, Lisa Wagner Erickson, she opened Theater 29. She actually has a physical space in Denver um, that she um, wanted to devote to work by Colorado Playwrights and that's it. New work by Colorado Playwrights, that's all that we do in that space. Um, so that was like a game changer for me as a Denver native because before that, um, you know, it's really hard to find space. Everything became a marijuana warehouse in Denver. I mean, it took like three or four years for all the industrial spaces that we used to work in to become marijuana warehouses. And I kid you not. So I think space is a challenge. And that, but I think, you know, to Katie's point, like um, to think about unconventional places you can produce a play. And that's becoming, you know, you hear about that all the time the micro plays inside the home, once COVID's over, smaller audiences, alternates, anything that's like, you know, when you're planning a wedding, the way to get a really cheap wedding is to not tell anybody that it's for a wedding. <laughs> I mean, I think there's other places you can have, you can do theater that are not traditional theater spaces. Um, that said, I think it's it's incredible if you can have a relationship with a space that values local work. And I think my, my partner, Lisa, she always talks about how um, especially in, in non-New York or non-Chicago communities that there's this great privileging of voices that are outside the local area. But, you know, like Colorado is like the microbrew capital of the United States. You know, we, that's, we started pretty much started that whole microbrew thing, but we're also the home of Coors, but we're also, you know, so, but we can make that choice. Like this mm. is where we're going to make these awesome microbrews. We don't need to bring in. And so, so I think that, that finding your cohort who's committed to that, committing to, um, to doing um, work that's 100% local and grounded local. And if you can somehow, you know, parlay that into relationship and get space, um, I think that that's the huge challenge. And then, and, I'll, and technical, um, technical theater people remain, I think that's a lot harder, at least in, in our market. Um, there are the equity folks and there are people, there's an um, extremely talented tier of people who serve every other theater that's not equity. <laughs> um, and they are super busy. Um, so I think it's, it's the self for self-producing, that's the thing that was the biggest challenge for me when I was first getting started was was forging relationships with lighting designers and people who could build stuff and um, and make stuff. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that that's kind of my uh, more than two cents. <laughs> no, that's spectacular. Thank you so much, Ellen. I know you have just so much experience in that area, and and yeah, I know it can be difficult, but I think it's so inspiring that you're creating art where you are, which I think is really important and essential, and something that has that I've really found rewarding, especially since you know you can work with theaters across the country, and that's great. But to be able to build your own grassroots collective is really, really. Um, really, really rewarding as well. All right, we do have a question from the audience, and I think I know who I'm going to throw this to um, from Jody um, Antonor, uh, who is a new playwright, amazingly talented playwright, fabulous voice. Um, Jody asks, "How do you find an agent? What should you look out for? 
What did you have before submitting to one? And what do they expect from you after signing with one? Scott, would you like to speak to this since you <laughs> informed us that I, you have it? <laughs> um, I can speak to this. It will not be helpful um, because um, uh, um, my, I had a very bizarre route to getting my agent. And uh, and I'd like to begin this story. And there is a story here this time. Um, somebody actually had to die uh, because a um, long, long time ago, I um, was having this play uh, that was getting a reading. And um, I invited, I used the drama to, no, no, um, um, Oh God! Um, it's the book with all the resources in it, and um, and it, it, it lists all the um, the the artistic directors, literary managers, and agents. I invited everyone except uh, my professor Arthur Jerome's agent because I knew that she was um, um, she had been an agent forever and she was not taking new clients. I did not know that she had actually. Um, um, sold her agency to an associate who was looking for clients. So literally the only person I didn't invite was my my professor's agent who had taken up, um, she was sharing office space at Writers and Artists. I invited an agent named Scott Hudson at Writers and Artists. Scott had died. My, uh, uh, my professor's agent was handling his mail and found the invitation <laughs> and, and then brought it to um, his agent who then requested the script and I sent it and they liked it. And that's how I got my agent because I invited someone who died. So I told you there was a story there, but it, um, um, did not help. So, um, <laughs> uh, it, will not, it will not help you. But, uh, but as, as to that, I mean, um, I think, um, from what I understand agents, um, it depends on the agent. I remember when I was looking for one, uh, Helen Merrill, who was has, uh, passed away a long time ago, um, she said she would read the script as long as I signed a contract that I would not show that the script to anyone for six months. She had the exclusive right to read it for six months, and um, I, I passed. So I think it's... Um, you can submit um, and you know find out who is... Find out who they're, who's representing people um, and... Uh, and or who who people are representing, and then see if they're you know taking submissions. So yeah, that's that's really the the it's terrible that it's legal, <laughs> okay? but that's really it, it's it's a crapshoot. Um, mm. I hear it's easier in Los Angeles. I mean you know, but if you're a playwright, you know it's it, you you want your you know you probably want a New York literary agent, and it's incredibly random. I mean send them a, an inquiry letter and if they respond positively great D I, I think it's unwise to send a full script but send mm. an inquiry letter and if they respond you know and yeah invite them to your stuff annoy them <laughs> thanks scott that is that is quite a story and no i think that that's really really good advice does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we move on all good cool um and Jody, I believe that the Dramatist Guild chapter of Florida offered a series of workshops on agents. I will see if that's maybe something they'll be interested in doing again, um, but be on the lookout for those because they might do them again. All righty, we have another question from Doug Palheida, who is amazing. Uh, another Mad Lab uh, frequent playwright and OG Productions All Star. Um, he has a question about sort of going back to the submissions process and writing. Um, what helps you all, these writers, to quit writing? How do you know when you are done and you should have been done three versions ago? Uh, <laughs> maybe if it's, uh, maybe not, I don't know if anything's ever done, but how do you know maybe that it's ready to submit? Uh, Mark, I'll go ahead and, and let you answer that first. I, I thought he meant quit writing entirely. And you know, I was like, I'm this close, but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you can well, answer that question if you'd rather, but I, yeah, just, I don't no. think you could. <laughs> uh, but for a particular play, um, I certainly don't don't think it's done after the first production. To me, the first production is where you really see like where like any final flaws are or anything that you should cut away or trim. Um, so to me, I, I sort of know I'm done after like two or three productions. I feel like okay, it's, if it's getting produced. And getting produced, you know, fairly regularly, then I'm probably done. But I'm like one of those guys who's never done. I still, I look at my, I was looking at one of my plays today that, you know, how to be, 
um, 10 years old. And I was like, you know what? I could add a line here and it would be so much better. Um, so some of us are never done. Um, but after a couple productions, I would say you should probably stop. And I totally agree. And I'll um, bring in Isaiah here. Um, and Isaiah writes that it's important to accept that writing is a marathon, not a sprint. You should never stop writing if this is a li life that you would really um, like to pursue and are able to pursue. Um, surrounding yourself with uh, people who will be honest with you and having people give you feedback will help you make the play better and better. Ask those you trust. I think that's super key. Um, sometimes you should put a play down for some time and return to it when you've grown. So a lot of great advice there on what to do um, with your play as you're sort of moving through that development process um, and great advice from Mark as well. Um, Katie, do you want to chime in on that? I mean, I know. <laughs> I know yeah, actually. Uh, so like everyone's going to have their own process for it. For me, as someone who is an actor, I it's not done until I hear it out loud. Uh, so if I'm doing a one woman show, I have several drafts once I finish the script of going through and going, I don't like that section. Let me keep speaking it. Let me keep doing it. Let me mm -hmm. keep uh, my one woman show. I performed 25 different times. So that's 25 hours of that show a couple of years ago. And from show one to show 25 was a very different show. Having changed objectively little in the format, but a lot of it changes. So for me, as the actor writer, when I perform the piece is when I get to do that out loud. As just the writer, as just the playwright, I need to hear it out loud. I need mm -hmm. to hear it spoken. I need to hear what words the actors trip over. I need to hear what sections go really well, what sections fall flat. And then once I've heard that a few times and it starts to streamline and I go, that sounds good, that's when I'm personally done. Yeah, that's a good, it sounds like you have your system all figured out. I feel like I'm so glad I don't have to answer this question because uh, <laughs> I feel like there's no answer for me. Um, and Ellen, uh, if I could bring you in a little bit on this, um, have I'm sort of curious to know, bouncing off of Doug's question, have you ever had a script be produced by a theater or even one of your own collectives where it actually, parts of it were rewritten or changed through that process? like as a result of the production um, and the collaboration. The subsequent production. Mm. I I can say, um, I mean, I guess similar to Mark, I mean, I, I tend to work like after a production, I will make changes to my own work. Um, I think the, the things that we produce at Theater 29, so um, Theater 29 is the venue and playwrights can produce their own work within that venue. That's kind of how Theater 29 works. We're not like a producing company, self-producers come in and produce in that space. And I think that the process at our theater is so intensely collaborative because the playwright is there so much compared to mm -hmm. conventional production that I feel like there's a lot of work done along the way. And I think like it is kind of a priority of ours. Like if you wanna change, I mean, if, if you're comfortable asking actors to learn lines in tech week or whatever, but the, the, there's an understanding that as a playwrights theater, that, that the playwrights run the show is kind of the motto. And so I think that we there is a lot of work that is done, whether we've had all world premieres, I think, but this I think it would even, it, it, it even happen if they weren't world premieres. It's a very intensely collaborative process. It's different from production process elsewhere. So I think actually scripts might change more in that environment. Um, mm. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a little bit, um, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that you're picking your own director in your own tech crew, that's, that just, it just, I mean, for me, that makes it a really different, like when I'm the one have, having to make choices about um, the, how things are staged, I, I might, I think I'm more likely to change the lines or change the stage directions than I am in a more traditional kind of, everyone does their little part um, format. So I don't know. That's really neat. That sounds like a really amazing experience. And I know we probably all have had experiences that that range from working collaboratively, you know, and working in sort of a development process versus like, here's the script, have a great show, um, <laughs> send me my free ticket. <laughs> so that's really interesting. All right. Thanks, y'all. Um, well, we're just about to the end of our time. Um, I think we have another question here from um, Jeremy Stoney, who's a Mad Lab mentor for young writers. Um, when do you feel a script is ready to submit for publication. 
Oh, publication. That's not something I necessarily thought we, were, we might talk about. I didn't even consider it, but I'm, I'm glad someone brought it up. So when do you feel like it's ready? After a certain number of productions or just once you personally feel the script is locked? Um, I'll just sort of throw that out to the group, whoever wants to answer that. Um, any, any? <laughs> <laughs> If you want to just so, give a short answer, I can try and I can try and uh, echo it once you're done. Publication is the last part of the process as far as like step by step by step by step. There are some different things to think about and consider before publication. And that is something that you should think about. But if you're beginning and you're beginning to find your way this industry in a way through this craft. There are so many things because public publication and the theater industry and licensing and all of those different things are all separate world and spaces. You know, and just because a the theater company produces your work doesn't really mean they don't have to publish your work unless it's like mission piece. But again, if you're beginning your journey as a playwright, especially as a young playwright, publication is something that will organically find your way into the more that you work in a very separate entity. Thanks, Isaiah. And I'm I'm gonna really enjoy That's recapping great. this because uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what I think you're saying. Um, again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but publication is something that we're all working toward and is usually a more final part of the process for a piece. It also comes usually a little bit later in our careers, which I think confuses some people because that's not true in every area of writing, um, but it's something that you, know, you, that I think we, and I don't wanna speak for everyone, but that um, I think what Isaiah is saying is that, you know, it's not something that we're necessarily always 100% focused on, that we're focused on the licensing and the productions and that the play's gonna go through a process. And if we ha if we get so lucky, which I know uh, many, if not all of you have had this, that haven't where it's, it is published, um, that that's, that's a great thing that happens, but that often that's not where our focus is. Focus is. Um, I've submitted very few plays for pub, for publication opportunities, I'll just say. Um, but I'll let someone else chime in on that as well, because I know we we have a lot of published writers on this panel. Um, I, I I think it depends on what you're um, what you're going for, um, because um, you there are so many opportunities that um, are for plays that have uh, been unproduced or unpublished or specifically for plays that could have been produced but are definitely unpublished so um you know it's really um um you know like submit to things like the samuel french festival if you're eligible to submit for that um and and, and um that was a a, a um, I mean, it, it's always great to see your stuff in print. Um, I'm in Samuel French 21 from 1996, and it's like, yay! And it's just like, and an, it, it, it's it's quite thrilling to see it in a bookstore. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I I mean, I also just I recently self published through um, Amazon through Kindle Direct Publishing. I wrote a, a series of monologues and plays that were specifically directed. Um, to be uh, performed for um, and by uh, queer kids, and it was it, none of them have been produced. Some of them have been performed online, but I um, published those so that I could just get the material out there because I felt that you know queer youth needed something mm. like that. Um, but in so, but like other plays, um, um, you know, um, they've been submitted to publishers, and um, I, I've been rejected by the best publishers in this nation so, and i'm sure we all have so yeah it's 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 hard but um but yeah i think after um some you know successful productions where you can include like nice reviews um that might entice people yeah that that could be helpful that's great yeah second all of that and definitely second the samuel french off off broadway festival that's a great experience and a great opportunity um, let's see, I think we have time for one more audience question. So I'm just gonna ask um, maybe one person. Um, 
if I can find it, there it is, from um, Corey Skirdall, who I had the privilege of being on a panel with actually not that long ago. Um, please discuss your personal submission process. This is such a good question. How do you discipline yourself to submit works for consideration? Sitting down in the chair, daily, weekly, monthly? Um, I know for me it's, oh God, please, weekly, but who, yeah. <laughs> it sort of depends. Um, Mark, do you want to take that question? Oh, Mark, I'm sorry. I need to unmute you. Hold on, hold on. There you go. There you go, right. sir. Um, yes, I, uh, I, you know, go through all those different submission newsletters and things, and I make myself a little calendar. I just copy and paste the submission requirements into a little Word document and a little table, and I just list them by by due date. Um, and then I just, you know, I look at that every every day or a couple of days or so, just make sure there's nothing coming up that I, I don't want to miss. Um, and I, I just submit them as they as they come up. I'm, uh, you know, I always do them kind of late towards the deadline. But hey, if it's before the deadline, it's in. Um, and then I have, I keep a log of all my submissions. And, um, and I also belong to uh, this marketing group where we, every uh, two months out of the year, we try to submit every day for 30 days, uh, which really gets you into the habit of submitting. Um, because it really is, especially when you're starting out, it's a numbers game. Like when I was first starting out, I, I submitted, you know, four or five times a year. And I thought that was great. I was doing really good. Um, you know, and I, I got one or two productions a year. Um, and then I, then this guy's like, no, you have to submit hundreds of times a year. And I, I started ramping up my submissions. And amazingly enough, the more you submit, the more productions you get. Um, crazy how that works. And, and it really is a snowball effect because if you do keep relationships with these theaters, they start contacting you or you start knowing about their yearly festival or whatever they have. And you don't even have to like find their submission. You, they email you and say, hey, you know, Mad Lab is doing Theater Roulette again, time to submit, um, which is a lovely thing. And then soon you just have more and more productions just from your productions. Um, but that's it. I just make myself a calendar and, and stick to it and just try to submit uh, at least uh, once or twice a week. Oh, wow, that is that is so organized. Uh, love it. Um, Isaiah says that he makes, well, I love this too, I have some wine and make a party out <laughs> of it. Um, he submits and submits and submits all at once because um, he has his documents and opportunities for submission listed beforehand. I also tend to submit in big dumps because it, you know, you can have all of your stuff just ready to go. Um, and this is all Isaiah says while listening to Ariana Grande. It could be a long and tedious process. So anything to make it as fun as possible. I love that answer so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So just real fast, I wanted to give you all um, the opportunity to um, pitch anything you've got coming up or let us know about any projects you're excited about. Um, I, you weren't prepared for this, so I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but just do, feel free to do a little self-promotion, how people can, where they can follow you. Um, Katie, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to because I have a project that starts tomorrow. Um, I have my ticket. <laughs> yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Fringe Festivals are a wonderful opportunity to get your works done. Uh, right now, Orlando Fringe has a Winter Mini Fest. Uh, if you go to orlandofringe.org, you can click on their Winter Mini Fest tab. There are 26 different digital shows. Uh, each digital show is 10 bucks, or if you want to see a bunch of new work, you can buy an all access pass for 75 bucks. I like that I'm also doing a commercial for the fringe, but uh, you have a week to watch them on your own time uh, from the comfort of your no pants living room, however you live <laughs> your life. My project that will be as part of the festival is called Two Mates. Um, every night at Westminster Abbey at midnight, the spirits of Queen Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots rise to see if they can finish their unfinished business without annoying each other to death. If you can annoy someone to death when you're already dead. It's part ghost story, part the odd couple. So if that sounds fun to you, uh, orlandofringe.org, click on that Winter Mini Fest tab and you can watch the show digitally right there. I have my ticket. I am psyched. Uh, <laughs> and just in general, I agree. Fringe Miss is amazing. Anyone who doesn't know what a fringe is, who wants to check it out from the comfort of your living room, uh, please do. Ellen, what do you have coming up you'd like to share? So we have something going on at Theater 29 right now. I'm not a writer on the project, but um, just go to theater29denver.com and it's theater with an E 
E-R, not R-E, theater29denver.com. Um, the thing going on now is called Look, and it's a series of short monologues on a, um, filmed on phones. These are all COVID friendly. Um, mm -hmm. And then our next project coming up is called Hello, 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 um, which will be sort of a um, audience of one kind of scavenger hunt thing where you get some components of the story by email, some by text, and some by voicemail and some by mail mail. We're trying, we're still figuring that out. That's to come in the spring, but please um, keep your eye on theater29denver.com and see what we're up to. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Mark, what's going on in your world? Um, I am working on my first full length. I've been doing 10 minute plays for the longest time and I've now got a full length, um, mainly probably for high school theaters. So if, you, if there are any high school teachers out there looking for a, a funny play. Um, I've got one now. And um, I'm having a reading on January 31st. And uh, boy, can I confirm what Katie said? I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get any actors for a Zoom reading. And I had a gazillion actors volunteer, like three times more than I actually needed, which was fabulous. Um, actors are lovely. And they, you know, why are they doing this? I don't know. But God bless them for doing it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Last time I sent out a call, it was the same thing. Uh, I love it. Thanks, Mark. Scott, where can we look for you next? Um, I have uh, something um, going on right now. It's um, a um, virtual reading pre-recorded um, of my play Pangea, which is actually the second play in a trilogy, but you don't need to see the first one to be able to follow it. Um, and uh, in order to, it's free, and in order to get the link and the password, um, uh, you just have to send an email. Um, there's an automated response to Pangea the reading at gmail.com, and that's uh, P A N G E A, the reading, all one word. Um, and of course, um, we have um, uh, my Playwrights Roundtable um, uh, exciting onstage production with with COVID safety protocols that I'm just so excited about seeing um, of my play Outpost. And uh, Pangea and Outpost are both uh, science fiction plays that are very different. Um, and uh, those are the two things that are happening next or now. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, tickets for science fiction shorts, uh, which is where Outpost is going to be performed, coming soon. We're very excited to work with Scott. It's an absolutely um, outstanding play. Um, Isaiah has a lot of exciting things coming up. Um, he has um, an Instagram uh, handle that we're going to share in the chat um, for you all, um, at Isaiah Mikkel Reeves. Um, he also has a new Black Gay Horror play called Saturday the 13th. That sounds amazing. He didn't write that. I, I just said that. But I am shopping for virtual production. If anyone is interested in reading or seeing uh, seeing a video of the reading that's recorded, so you can uh, you can follow him on Instagram and get connected. Um, all righty, I want to say a huge, huge thank you um, to all of these playwrights for joining us tonight. I we have a couple of announcements. I know Stephen Woosley of Mad Lab is going to come up and tell us about some 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 additional workshops we've got coming up. But again, thank you all so much. Take care out there. Um, and we'll hopefully see you soon. And I know we'll be seeing your work at Mad Lab. So take care of playwrights. I'm going to take you off the screen one at a time. Just smile and wave, smile and wave. Scott's last. Okay. <laughs> if any of you are interested in submitting to Mad Lab as the literary manager, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that we're accepting uh, short plays and full length plays at this time. And let's bring on Mr. Stephen Woosley. Woos, hello. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah. I want to commend the uh, commend you for hosting this uh, as our literary manager and um, one of our and a great playwright also. Uh, and it's uh, I said it was a distinguished and very uh, very good looking panel, and I don't regret that at all. Uh, and uh, and it, you know we've worked with several of them. Um, I've been doing Mark Harvey Levine shows since I started back in theater in Columbus for the last fifteen years. Uh, so, uh, he's always been great and actually getting to know him has been great as well. Ellen Graham, we know, we, we just started doing her shows a couple years ago and we've already told her we're not letting her go, even though she's in Denver. Uh, and, and, and I can't wait to, to go to Denver and get to theater 29. And, uh, I'm so glad you guys are at Outpost because we just did it the last roulette we were able to do 2018 we loved it so much. So, I'm um, looking forward to that. But I just, uh, so we're going to be doing, trying to do these about once every month. This is an idea Tay Lane came up with, uh, and she's uh, she's always been, I'm the president of OGP, but also a frequent Mad Lab contributor, as you guys all know the Mad Lab work. 
Um, but I'm the president of OGB. But anyway, she's a frequent contributor to both places as well. And she came up with this idea. She texted me and Colleen and said, hey, we should come up with a way to one, something to do and a way to help people be better when we're done with all this COVID stuff. And that was like before, before the Zoom stuff started exploding. But um, so uh, Colleen and I kind of started putting together uh, some different nights. So the plan is to kind of hit different things. Like tonight, obviously, playwriting, we thought we'd start there. And, and you know, the idea of, you know, uh, how do I get produced? So next month, uh, our plan is it's going to be more of a directing thing. But what do directors look for when you audition? So it'll kind of be a directing and acting mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but I think it, there's stuff there for everyone. Uh, and then we've got just some some general ideas for the future. But, uh, you know, maybe how, uh, how to form an LLC. Uh, maybe that'll be down the road. For the <laughs> I have to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we're, we're hoping to have similar panels like this where we have a lot of different people. Um, and again, one of the, the few good things about this, this stupid thing is being able to get people to, to come in and hang out. So it was great seeing, again, Scott and Alan from, from uh, you know, Denver and New York and all that, and Mark from Indy and, 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 well, and, and Katie from all over, and, and you guys from, from down south. And, um, but if you have ideas, if you're interested in getting involved, um, please send them. You can send them to my, my Mad Lab address, Stephen W. There it is, at madlab.net. Uh, shoot it there. If you're interested in getting involved or you just have an idea, like I said, a specific idea, like, like this one or, or whatever, and it can be anywhere. Cause so, so we're looking at doing like directing, acting, an improv show, technical stuff even, uh, even uh, that kind of stuff. And it can, it can get more focus or less focus. So, uh, we're like I said, we're hoping to do it every month. Um, originally, we were hoping maybe every other week. That might have been a little too ambitious, but we'll see. Maybe maybe once we get rolling uh, and start doing a lot of delegating. Uh, one other thing, we are hoping to kind of we'll do it. We'll probably do them here live, but we're also going to um, transition them to YouTube as well, so you can catch them later. You know, if you want to rewatch or you missed something or you know, or it wasn't captured there. And sometimes going back and finding a Facebook live event can be a uh, needle in a haystack. So sometimes uh, YouTube's a little easier. Even though we're getting more and more, more, uh, more and more videos there. But uh, anyway, so thanks everyone. Thanks everyone who watched. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you for future ones. Spread the word. And again, thanks to playwrights, and thank you, Bethany, for uh, starting us off here. As uh, you always come through for us. So uh, yeah. So I don't know, okay. I don't know what else. To say, I love that. One. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you all again. And have a have a wonderful evening. Take care of yourselves out there. Right.